depicting the two of them in with uh, sharing their video and everything at the same time and doing all the normal stuff was, well, my normal setup is complicated enough. Let's just say that. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, we're back again here tonight. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, oh, Ray Burns, you guys were very good. He says you were all in their best behavior. Yes, yes, you were very good. Uh, even when Alan and Sean were uh, uh, egging you guys on <laughs> in the Discord chat. So that's all good. Uh, anyway, excellent. So uh, tonight, just a couple quick announcements uh, before we get going. The, the primary announcement is our next regional moot, uh, which is approaching swiftly. Bay moot is coming uh, in not very long, like a week and a half. So it's uh, on the 23rd of November. So if you're any Anywhere in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're going to be in Berkeley on the 23rd of November. I'm really looking forward to getting out there, giving a talk, meeting people and hanging out there uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, please do join us. It's a, a, a really fun, cheap day. You get lunch and we'll all go out to dinner afterwards uh, and uh, it's going to be really cool. So. Uh, again, I, so all you have to do, go to signumuniversity.org, scroll down just a little bit, and you'll see our events uh, panel for Baymoot. Go there to our Baymoot page, and there's a registration link right there. And in, er, actually, for a couple more days, you can still even submit a proposal. Is there something you want to discuss? Uh, you can present, of course, if you want to present a paper. Um, or you can, uh, if there's like a topic you'd like to discuss, totally mention that too, and we'll do uh, some discussion. It's pretty cool. Um, so we'll see. Brandon, we will see. I'm not going to promise a reenactment. It's going to depend. See, th th this is a tricky reenactment. Um, we've not been able to find the opportunity to do this, mostly because we need the right setup. We need a table, you know, ideally, at least one table. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I'm not going to promise it, but if it comes up, it comes up, and I'll, I'll, I'll let people know. Um, but um, anyway, okay, so that's... Um, uh, uh, that's the, um, uh, the, the limiting factor is a table. No, it's just one of the factors making it a little more complicated than other reenactments have been. That's all. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. No, it was, it was surprisingly hard, JJ. I know that doesn't sound like much, right? But, uh, but uh, it was it was surprisingly difficult actually to find appropriate tables and chairs uh, at our venue. We were wanting to we we're thinking about doing it uh, in where we were having dinner afterwards at at Middlemoot, but there was a like super loud uh, music and football going on, and B um, uh, really really poor internet, and C the tables were all bolted to the ground and there were no chairs and I couldn't move things around, so it was really really hard. Anyway, so, yeah, hard to get exactly for Thomas. We'd have to get a canopy and all kinds of things, right? Uh, we could probably, we, we could have winged that, but, uh, uh, but we'll, um, we'll see. Anyway, so uh, I'm still working on the seating arrangements reenactment. That's still on uh, top on my list of reenactments that I want to do. And we will, um, uh, and we will, we will see. Yeah, exactly, JJ. We totally could have cast someone as the canopy uh, if need be. Um, but, um. Anyhow, okay, so, but Baymoot, whether or not we do a reenactment there, it is definitely happening, and it's definitely going to be great. So I hope that uh, uh, that uh, those of you, again, who are in the area are able to join us there. Uh, so please do go to signumuniversity.org. Actually, you can go straight, I think, to university.org slash events, and you'll see the Baymoot page on there and the registration link on the Baymoot page. Okay, um, so that's my, that's my chief announcement for tonight. Um, also, don't forget, this is my secondary announcement for tonight, don't forget that tomorrow night we're continuing A Wizard of Earthsea, our new uh, discussion that's happening in the in the Mythgard Academy series. We're doing A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin, and tomorrow is class number two. We, we did the opening. <laughs> it won't surprise you to hear. We got a little carried away. There's a poem at the beginning. It was a little epigram, a five-verse, five-line five poem at the beginning of, uh, of, of the book, which kind of delayed us for a while before we actually started page one. JJ, exactly. We totally did. In fact, we got well past page one. Um, we were up into the double digits by the end of the class. But anyway, it's we're 
will continue at the blazing speed, which is customarily associated with uh, um, with Mythgard Academy, at least compared to uh, compared to around here. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so so we're actually I'm actually still planning to complete our discussion of of a Wizard of Earth sea before the holidays uh, this year. So again. Uh, galloping pace uh, in the Mythgard Academy. It's bracing. Um, anyway, all right. Let us um, uh, let us then check back in. Uh, we, okay, so yeah. So what I was going to talk about at the beginning here tonight, um, instead of doing... You, you know how normally um, we get... Uh, before we go back into the text, we get drawn back into discussions that we've had previously uh, by uh, by different questions and things from, from folks. Well, tonight, we had some interesting questions, uh, but none, none of them that I wanted to talk about tonight. I think I'm going to come back to a couple of them later on. But... Um, but I wanted to draw us back just a little bit because uh, there's one last thing I wanted to touch on before we move ahead uh, towards our next poem, which we should get to tonight. Um, and that is very, very brief thing. I just wanted to mention this because I talked about the 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 composition history of the poem that Bilbo sang, right? We did the Errantry poem, and then we did what I call the Rivendell poem because it's how the poem gets changed when Tolkien first puts it in Rivendell, right, as sung by Bilbo. And then, of course, it gets revised into the full Arendel was a Mariner uh, poem. So you remember that middle version, right, which is like of the unnamed dude who appears to be immortal, who's kind of abducted to fairy, finds him, wakes up up and finds himself in Valinor, right? Gets kitted out, uh, gets put in a flying boat, um, and then sent off to to kill Ungoliant and then, like, have lightning bolts shoot out of his eyes, right? Um, that poem. And then, of course, he still ends up as the Flammifer of Westerness and everything. Well, um, there's an an the, the analog in, the, in that early draft, which contained that version of the poem, there's an analog to the discussion between Lindir and, uh, and, and Bilbo. And there's a really intriguing difference. And I just wanted to share this before we move on because it's kind of worth looking at. Here's the original draft of that after discussion. Remember, Bilbo has just said there's different as peas and apples, right? No, little peas and large peas, said some. That is the difference between hobbits and, 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 and men. Their languages all taste much the same to us anyway, said others. I won't argue with you, said Bilbo. I am sleepy after so much music and singing. I'll leave you to guess if you want to. Well, we guess that we guess that you thought of the first two lines, and Tarkil did all the rest for you, they cried. Tarkil is, of course, Dunedon. Uh, uh, that's Aragorn. Wrong. Not even warm. Stone cold, in fact, said Bilbo with a laugh. He got up and came towards Frodo. Well, that's over, he said in a low voice. It went off better than I expected. I don't often get asked for a second hearing for any reason. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of it was Tarkil's. I'm not going to try and guess, said Frodo, smiling. I was half asleep when you began. It seemed to follow on from something I was dreaming about, and I didn't realize it was really you who were speaking until near the end. Okay. So, um... Notice two striking things, right? Lots of similarities between this passage and the passage that we see in the published text, right? But two striking differences. First, the Lindir character who is not named, I think, at all. Yes, he's not named um, in the original text. So we don't get this sense of Bilbo and a particular elf, right? Which, in the published text, really does, as we were talking about last time, give us a sense of... Bilbo and, you know, having built friendships there in Rivendell, right? There are, there are elves with whom he normally banters about this kind of thing. Um, but the, uh, um, the second, so that, that's one small thing, but the two things that I would really draw attention to, which seem to me very interesting and significant, is that first, the elvish interlocutor guesses, right? And the guess of the elf is that Bilbo wrote the first two lines and Tarkil did all the rest for you, right? So the, uh, the, the hobbitry element, right, is even more pronounced. Like, we, we get the elf coming back with a zinger, right? So when Bilbo pushes him to guess, his guess is, I, you didn't write any of that, right? Um, or, I mean, you, maybe you wrote the first two lines and then you, you let... So basically, 
uh, you know, Tarkil ghost uh, was the ghost writer for the whole thing, basically, is what the elf says, presumably teasingly, right? Um, but of course, it turns out that the truth is that, as a matter of fact, quite a lot of it was Tarkil's, right? So in the original, um, uh, yes, so Fort Thoughtless, absolutely, yes. Uh, Fort Thoughtless says, do we know if the name Tarkil motivates the orc's use of Tark as a term for the men of Gondor? Absolutely, yes. That is where that orcish term comes from. It's a shortening of the uh, what the elves call uh, uh, Gondor, or not Gondorians, Numenorians. Um, so, uh, so yes, and so it's kind of interesting, right, that Tarkil gets changed um, uh, to Dunedon, uh, but the orcs still retain uh, that, and so it's much more puzzling uh, when um, the uh, when the orcs, when Shagarat and Gorbag are talking about those bloody Tarks, you know, those bloody-handed Tarks, um, and we can't really guess. Whereas in the original draft, we would have had, um, because Aragorn would have been called Tarkil several times, um, we we would have had the ability to guess. Uh, much at least it would have been a heck of a lot more easier uh, for us to uh, be able to guess what they were talking about. Um, but um, anyway, yeah. So okay. So Brandon, now I'm trying to remember, and now I probably should remember more clearly. But these drafts all run together in my head. Somebody would have to look it up to confirm if they could. Um, this is page 84 of the Treason of Isengard, as you can see. If you happen to have your copy next to you, look it up and tell me. I think that this is after. Trotter the Hobbit has become Aragorn, right? So it's it's not the very first time they get to Rivendell because he doesn't sing. The very first time they get to Rivendell, I think it's, it's but it's the first time this song gets included, um, which again I think is down the road after, uh, you know, Trotter is no longer the Hobbit with wooden shoes, but has now become the Numenorean dude. Um, that's why he's talking about Tarkil, which does definitely mean that. Um, Anyway, okay, so, well, Brandon, I'm not 100 percent sure. I I would I would want to double double check. I I again I'm not 100 percent remembering which of the like seven versions of the Rivendell story uh, this one exactly is. Um, but um, anyway, um, so again, so two things. One, the elf teases him that he didn't write any of it, and then secondly. He whispers to Frodo, as a matter of fact, quite a lot of it was Tarkil. So Tolkien's initial impulse when it came to this poem, and, and, and you remember how much that, you know, what how mortals fare when they stray among the elves or when they come under the influence of the elves or within the power of the elves even, um, that poem was originally conceived as a collaboration between Bilbo and Tarkil, between the Hobbit and the man, right? Uh, and we talked about this some um, last week, of course, about the, you know, and some, some of you were making some good observations and, and Sean was making some good observations about, uh, about hobbits and men and their connections, right? Um, that we get through this, both of them sort of together on the other side of the mortal immortal divide, right? On the, the mortal and elves divide, you know, that, you know, as the elves are lumping them together, um, um, Yes, and true, Mad Violinist, you are correct that Arwen does not exist at this point uh, in the drafting history, uh, right? So Aragorn's relationship to the elves is somewhat different, absolutely. Um, he is, there's a closer parallel between Bilbo and Aragorn then, right? Both of them are mortals who are living in Rivendell. Um, and although they have very different histories, um, the Aragorn of the published text is a little closer to the elvish side, right? Or at least he's, you know, he's right at the edge of the line and kind of leaning over it, right? Uh, in some fairly significant ways. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, anyway. Tolkien initially conceives of this as a collaboration between the two. The interesting thing to me is how that changes, right? And, you know, as you guys know, especially uh, those of you who did the History of Middle, have been doing the History of Middle Earth discussions with me in the Mythgard Academy, know that one of the things that I really love to look at when we're, when we're looking at the different, you know, the earlier drafts and the way things change, um, you know, there are a lot of times we, we can be 
It's easy to be over rash in the, in the conclusions that we draw when we see Tolkien making changes from his earlier drafts. And as Christopher, as editor, is always very quick to, to remind us, just because Tolkien changed his mind, you know, took something out of the text, doesn't mean he totally changed his mind about it. It doesn't mean that he, that, that ceases to be true anymore. Sometimes he just removes something or makes a change because of how it's, because he wants to present it differently, not because he's actually rejected a particular concept, right? But anyway, one of the things that I am always interested in is, in a sense, what is the trajectory of the text, right? What do the, what can we see? Um, it to, For me, it's kind of less about where does the final text end up and more about what is the direction that, Tolkien appears to be going in, right? What is the direction that Tolkien seems to be pushing the text in that we can see, right? When we look at the change between an earlier draft and a later draft. And, um, and my answer to that here, right, is it, it begins in this earlier draft with the song being a genuinely collaborative effort between the two different mortals, between Bilbo and Aragorn, right? Um, with the elf teasingly, but still kind of tellingly, saying that he suspects that Aragorn wrote practically the whole thing, right? Now here's teasing Bilbo, of course, by saying that, but there's also, um, we can also see that the elf, howsoever poor he may claim himself to be at distinguishing between different sizes of pea, uh, he nevertheless is able to make a pretty shrewd guess at the fact that Aragorn was heavily involved, and this is not just Bilbo's work, right? But then in the published text, that gets shifted very significantly, right? Um, and now the poem is almost 100% Bilbo. It went from like 50-50, Bilbo and Aragorn, to like 99-1, right? Um, Bilbo and Aragorn. And the joke about him thinking of the first two lines and Tarkil doing all the rest is cut out entirely, right? Um, Lindir doesn't even make that joke. Um, he doesn't even whisper the idea uh, to the reader that maybe Aragorn, like, Lindir doesn't even seem to suspect that Aragorn wrote the whole thing or even a significant part of it. And in fact, he didn't, right? Um, so uh, anyway, so that seems to me really interesting that as Tolkien came to revise this poem, so in the process of revising it from the nameless mortal who ends up kidnapped by elves, killing Ungoliant and shooting light bolt, right, lightning bolts out of his eyes, and then uh, and then uh, uh, becoming the Flambefer of the West, to Eärendil was a mariner, right? It being the explicit story of Eärendil, which gets de-heroicized, right? Much less heroic, much less action-packed uh, than the, that middle version, right? So as we're toning down the heroism, we're increasing the, we're, we're identifying it firmly with Eärendil, but decreasing the heroism of it and emphasizing, uh, really, therefore, sharply emphasizing, I would say, um, the, well, helplessness isn't quite the right word, but the, um, uh, the, well, difficulties, at the very least, right, uh, that mortals face uh, when they encounter elves, that gets emphasized, I think, in the final version of the poem, and that correlates with the authorship of the poem being shifted more completely to Bilbo. So this becomes Bilbo's project, right? Bilbo's perspective, which, if anything, Aragorn is distancing himself from. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Mad Violinist, you mentioned before about Arwen not existing, and so uh, Aragorn not having that reason to uh, you know, increase his proximity to, uh, to, to, to elves. Um, but of course that's still true in the published text, essentially, right? Because, uh, when Tolkien wrote, when Tolkien wrote this revised version, right? The revised version that we're reading in the published text, um, Arwen still hadn't existed, right? The paragraph that we're about to segue to tonight, um, is going to be the, well, okay, let me revise that too. The paragraph, which I hope that we're going to get to tonight, um, is itself one of the only late editions uh, in this passage. The rest of it, this stuff about Bilbo taking credit for the whole poem, was in there before Arwen's invention, 
Right. Um, so Ar- Aragorn's motivation to not tick off his father-in-law and to to you know back slowly away from this project and not become associated with it, um, it works and it's fun to talk about. And I mean, again, it 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 fits and it's as so much of Tolkien's retconning does. Um, it fits it fits and it works really well. Um, but at the same time, I don't. Um, um, uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's clearly not in, you can't argue that it's in the intention of the text because that text was written long before that intention existed. So, okay. Um, anyway, I just wanted to draw your attention to that because it's another fun little kind of data point to think about as we, as we kind of think about how this works. And especially, here comes my segue, as we transition into the following passages after the initial discussion with Frodo and Frodo's acknowledgement that it seemed to follow from something that he was dreaming about. Um, uh, then we have, um, uh, you know, uh, something different. So let's look at the different thing that we get here. It is difficult to keep awake here until you get used to it, said Bilbo. Not that hobbits would ever acquire quite the elvish appetite for music and poetry and tales. They seem to like them as much as food, or more. They will be going on for a long time yet. What do you say to slipping off for some more quiet talk? Can we? said Frodo. Of course. This is merrymaking, not business. Come and go as you like, as long as you don't make a noise. They got up and withdrew quietly into the shadows and made for the doors. Sam they left behind, fast asleep, still with a smile on his face. In spite of his delight in Bilbo's company, Frodo felt a tug of regret as they passed out of the Hall of Fire. Even as they stepped over the threshold, a single clear voice rose in song. Okay. Yeah, Brandon points out... uh, Okay, uh, Bilbo's going off alone with the ring here, right? Uh, is there any anxiety um, among, uh, uh, you know, like Gandalf and Elrond as they're watching this? Like, let's go sneak off uh, where we're not being supervised anymore. Um, Brandon, I, I think that that's, um, uh, that's a really interesting point, and I hadn't thought of that. My suspicion is that it's okay, right? And, and JJ, as you point out, even Sam has let his guard down, right? Um, and I think that my suspicion is that if they were watching them, and I assume that they were, they saw how that ended, right? They saw Bilbo's recognition, right? They saw Bilbo making the right call there. Exactly. He passed the test, Rinroos. And I think that they can see uh, that he that he passed the test there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and as Mad Violinist points out, Sam is going to be sent after them relatively quickly, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, maybe we do have something of a trust but verify situation going on here uh, uh, from Gandalf there. Um, yeah, Brick Tales, I also really like the comparison between the elvish love of poetry and the hobbitish love of food. Um, it, it's interesting that that's Bilbo's specific comparison, right? I mean, on the one hand, he's pointing to this remarkable elvish stamina, right? That as long as, you know, music and poetry and tales are going on, like that, that they seem to be able to sustain themselves on those alone. And that seems, in fact, entirely possible, actually. Um, but I don't, um, uh, I don't think that I don't think that that necessarily means that uh, they, like, I mean, is there an actual physical subsistence there? I don't know. I mean, I think that he's, uh, um, you could take that in a couple different ways. I mean, you could take it, Bricktail's kind of like you're suggesting that uh, they, el- the elves, that is, that song and, and poetry and, and, you know, so music and poetry and tales fill the same like niche in um, in Elvish culture uh, that food does in Hobbit culture uh, that seems very possible, um, but I suspect that he's being a little bit more literal than that. Um, that basically, give an elf a choice between music, poetry, tales, 
on the one hand and food on the other hand, and he's going to choose the former every time. He'd rather go without food than go without music and poetry and tales. Um, uh, whereas Bilbo, who loves music and poetry and tales quite a bit, right, um, is not going to always make that make that choice, right? Um, oh, by the way, um, sorry. Uh, I, one last point I meant to go back to, and I'm just remembering it now. Um, a couple of you were observing this, and it was a good observation. So let me pause here for a second and go. You see, you thought we were started, but we're. I'm going back for one more second. Um, Mad violinist and and Matt. I saw both of you uh, talking about this. Um, Their languages all taste much the same to us anyway. Said others is a a really really uh, cool phrase, right? I am kind of sorry that that got taken out. Um, I I cannot help but think that that is a little bit of uh, I don't know a little bit of an autobiographical expression on Tolkien's part. Actually, um, that sounds very much the way. Uh, there are there other Tolkien characters who talk about languages that way? In particular, characters that we can see in the Notion Club papers and in the Lost Road. Um, which I think are quite substantially autobiographical in some of those regards. Um, so um, anyway, yeah, I, uh, um, I I do think that that's it's really interesting. And Matt was talking about a similarity to to uh, an Irish turn of phrase. Matt, you were saying about poetry, right? About sort of uh, uh, sort of tasting uh, tasting poetry, right? Um, uh, and it's interesting that uh, that Tolkien uses that same kind of. I, I I suspect it's the same it's the same kind of thing, um, but um, yeah yeah um, yeah good um, yeah Tora Marthen, yeah he does he does compare languages to foods or, or to wine at times. Um, he does talk about the taste of languages. That's, I, that, that is something that um, I, I think we can be fairly confident that Tolkien himself thought about it that way. Um, even, the, even the way in which um, the, I was about to say Lindir, but it's not, the elf here um, is connecting it He's basically extending the food image, right? No little peas and large peas, right? Their languages all taste much the same to us anyway, just as small and large peas pretty much taste the same, right? They might look a little bit different, but, you know, eat a spoonful of them and they'll taste all pretty much. You're not going to be able to tell tell the difference of their taste, right? Um, And uh, and so apparently are the languages of mortals uh, to the elves. Uh, or to this to this elf anyway. Um, my uh, um, my suspicion, if I had to guess, and this is a perilous guessing, let me tell you, uh, as to why Tolkien took that out. Um, my guess is that I think that he would have been dissatisfied. Basically, an elf wouldn't have been that tone deaf. Right. Like no self-respecting elf would actually be able to listen to two totally separate mortal languages and not being able to tell the difference of their taste. Right. I mean, he might be he might have a hard time in some ways, might have a hard time saying which one is which. Right. But but for him to just say they all they all kind of taste the same to me, I suspect that uh, what. Again, this is just a, rent, a guess on my part, but um, but my guess is that uh, uh, he wouldn't want to depict the elf as being that um, having that poor a palate for language because that was a thing that elves l- liked and were really good at. Um, uh, yeah, Toromarth and the elf could be just trolling them there, right? That could just be another uh, another teasing statement there. Um, but anyway, um, I, 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 so yeah, so, I mean, I think, um, exactly brick tales, elves love language too much for an elf to make that kind of joke. Anyway, he's not gonna, he's not going to depict himself as being so oblivious as that. Um, yeah. Um, 
so yeah, for Thoughtless, I don't have I don't have any problem with the tone. The tone seems to me not only to fit in with the rest of it, uh, but to fit in with the with the exchange that we see. I mean, you know, as I was saying before, I think the tone of the exchange between Lindir and Bilbo is very similar to the tone of the exchange of the Tralalalali elves with the dwarves, and very similar to what we see from Gildor in the Shire with Frodo. Um, I don't see any significant difference there in the. Uh, um, frivolousness and uh, humor uh, of their uh, of their speech. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, but so anyway, thank you. I thank you guys for your comments on that. Glad I remembered at a little past the last second to go back and talk about that. Um, okay. Um, Bilbo um so the elves seem to like them as much as food or more. They will be going on for a long time yet. What do you say to slipping off for some more quiet talk? Now, on the one hand, this is sort of interesting, right? Because first, Bilbo has contrasted the elvish appetite for music and poetry and tales with the elvish appetite for food, right? They seem to like these things more than they like food. They'll be going on for a long time yet. What would you say to slipping off for what, like a snack, <laughs> right? Let's 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 Frodo. Let's go choose food over. And after all, as far as we know, Bilbo hasn't really had dinner, right? He missed the feast. Um, and yet, what is Bilbo wanting? Bilbo is wanting more quiet talk, right? Elves thrive on speech alone, Bilbo's going to say later on, right? And he seems to be speaking in that way to Frodo here. They will be going on for a long time yet, right? So let's go off and do our own tales, right? Let's go off and have our own talk. So he's just... What he's proposing to Frodo here is not, in a sense, a fundamentally different activity. He's just saying, let's let's replace the elvish music, poetry, and tales with Hobbit talk, right? That's what I'm going to... So he's choosing genres here, right? And Simon, exactly, I agree. Quiet talk about the Shire is very different from epic Elvish tales and, and from Elvish music. Very different. Um, but yet it's re, it's just a it's just a genre shift. And it's, again, it seems to me interesting. He's like, oh yeah, Elves thrive. You know, again, I keep quoting the line that he's not going to deliver until the next chapter. Um... Well, into the next chapter, really. I shouldn't do that. Um, Hobbits can't ever acquire quite the elvish appetite, right? So he seems to be suggesting, I've had enough, right? Um, Hobbits aren't ever going to have quite the elvish appetite. Um, The elves like them better than food. They're going to be going on for a long time yet. So what he has said to that point makes it sound like, whew, yeah, I just don't have the stamina. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm full up, right? Um, let's go off somewhere else and do something else. But what he says is, let's go out and have a more quiet talk. And JJ, maybe it is something like somebody, um, you know, how, uh, how did the narrator describe the food they were given in the prancing pony? Good, solid food, right? Um, maybe Bilbo would like to, uh, you know, has had enough you know, fancy nibbles and would like, uh, or, or even, you know, extraordinary, uh, delicacies and would like to, you know, have, uh, have some cheese and crackers back in the room. Uh, you know, perhaps it's something like that. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, and Brandon, I agree. I mean, again, we know that Bilbo's appetite for music, poetry, and tales is prodigious. Remember how everyone was rolling their eyes, right, at his farewell speech, thinking that some poetry was imminent, right? Um, we know that his appetite for these things far exceeds normal Hobbit appetite for these things, right? Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, Um Yeah, good. Let's see. Um, And it's interesting. Galandar is pointing out there's nothing necessarily to prevent them from carrying on with Shire tales in the the Hall of Fire. Um, Plenty of conversation seems to be going on. And indeed, they've been doing small talk, 
right? They've been telling Bilbo, you know, he, with the help of Sam, um, about the small doings of the Shire. You know, they, they've been talking, they've been doing real news for a while before the singing happened, before Bilbo singing happened anyway, right? Um, so that is kind of an interesting thing, right? Um, does, is Bilbo suggesting something else, right? Um, you know, I'm not really, uh, uh, I'm not really sure. Um, Frodo says, can we, right? Frodo clearly does not, I mean, this is his first time in the Hall of Fire. It's his first feast, right, in Elrond's Hall. It's his first time out of bed, right, uh, since they've been in Rivendell. And so he clearly is worried that it might be, um, uh, it might be uh, rude, right? They might be insulting Elrond if they leave. Um, but here's the other thing. I, I skipped over a sentence, right, at the beginning. It is difficult to keep awake here until you get used to it, said Bilbo. Um he has gotten used to it, and still, f from what we can see, finds it difficult to keep awake there. Um, but he seems to be empath empathizing with Frodo, right? Knowing the kind of experience that Frodo is likely to carry on having um, while they're in the Hall of Fire. Um, there does seem to be, and somebody was um, uh, somebody was talking uh, about this. Um, yeah, good. Uh, WKU was saying it would be uh, Bilbo. It could be Bilbo acknowledging that Frodo hasn't built up the stamina yet. Absolutely good. You were remembering that sentence, WKU. Um, yeah, Frodo is still um, tired, right? This is Frodo's first day up. And of course, just as Sam is going to soon f track them back to Bilbo's room uh, and, you know, hint to Frodo that he really should go to bed soon. Um, Bilbo already might also be kind of transitioning Frodo out of that. I mean, remember the, 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 this transcendent aesthetic experience that Frodo has just had, right, under the influence of Elvish enchantment, can't exactly be, even though he kind of felt as if he were asleep, right? Um, to some extent, perhaps the problem is almost the opposite of that, right? Um, maybe a little bit too much, uh, for Frodo in his current uh, current um, position here, um, yeah, um, yeah, it, it is JJ a little perilous. I think uh, might be a good way to think about it. Um, yeah, certainly quiet talk with just the two of them sounds substantially more. Uh, more relaxing. <laughs> Brandon, I like that. Brandon loves it. He says, sleep if sleep you call it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, Come and go as you like, as long as you don't make a noise, says Bilbo, which is presumably not how it was explained to him. Uh, but this is Bilbo. Notice how this is also Bilbo putting the Hall of Fire into Hobbit terms, right? He makes the whole thing this is merrymaking, right? Frodo doesn't even, like, this is just a party. Like, everyone's supposed to be having fun. This is, like, for your benefit, right? Not a burden on you, not meant to be a responsibility of yours, right? And f and Bilbo, who's accustomed to these things much more than Frodo, is able to, 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 to put this into Hobbit language, right? Come and go as you like, as long as you don't make a noise, right? Don't worry, I'm an insider. I know the rules, and I'm going to you know, transmit them. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to help you understand this entire thing, um, in a more sort of hobbit oriented way. Um, yeah. So they got up and withdrew quietly into the shadows and made for the doors. Um, they're not making a noise, nor are they making a sight right there. Um, you know, <laughs> They're sneaking out here, um, again, presumably so as not to cause a disturbance when they leave, right? They don't want to, you know, stand up and wave to everybody and, you know, have every, you know, try to draw people's attention to them, right? They seem to be, um, they seem to be leaving very circumspectly, right? Um, <laughs> 
come and go as you like as long as you don't make a noise is kind of like a myth card stream jj you're right um yeah and though rayburns i'm sure there are quite a few eyes watching them i agree with that sam has fallen asleep and but is presumably in that same brandon sleep of sleep you call it state right i suspect that sam is there um is there transported by you know the same uh uh the same enchantment that we saw Frodo experiencing before. Um, in, and then we get the... Um, yeah, so two last things there about that paragraph before we get to our next poem. Um, Frodo's division of mind, right? In spite of his delight in Bilbo's company, Frodo felt a tug of regret as they passed out of the Hall of Fire. Um, Elvish singing is not a thing to miss, right? Um, and he's delighted in Bilbo's company. Going off for a quiet talk is clearly something that, you know, when Frodo asks, can we? You know, he doesn't say, should we? He doesn't say, you know, must we? You know, he says, can we? Like, you know, would it be allowed? Can we do that? Um, it's clearly something he would like very much. And yet, he cannot help um, but feel the tug. Uh, right as he's as he's leaving, it's hard to leave the Elvish poetry behind. Um, and then, of course, Brandon, exactly as you say, um, as they stepped over the threshold, a single clear voice rose in song. Right. So at the moment of the crossing of the threshold, and I agree with Brandon, we're in fairy. Crossing a threshold seems a significant thing, right? Or at least we're somewhere like in fairy certainly bilbo's song might lead us to connect rivendell with fairy right certainly in parallel it is um uh and yes galandar you're right that frodo can't be sure how many more opportunities he'll have to hear elvish singing now it turns out he's going to have more than he might think on this evening right um uh whereas yeah, yeah bilbo lives here now right so uh it's not as big a deal to him um but anyway uh the coincidence of this song with just as they cross the threshold is interesting. How significant is that? I'm not sure. Let's hear what the single clear voice is singing about um, as they go. Because Rayburns, that's just what I was thinking too. So here, of course, um, is the poem. A Elbereth Gilthoniel, Silivren Pena Miriel, O Menel Aglar Elenath, Nahired Palandiriel, O Galath, O Galath Remin Enorath, Fanuelos Le Linathon, Nevair Si Nevairon. Okay, what do you notice about the poem? See, this is lovely because you know that most of the time when we talk about poetry, I want to make sure that we talk about the sound and the shape of it first before we talk about its meaning, right? And since most of us don't understand its meaning, that makes it easier, right? Um, so before we talk about its meaning at all, tell me about the sound of it. What do you notice? Compare and contrast to other poems that we've heard. A elbereth gilthoniel se livren pena miriel o menel aglar elenath. Yeah, iambic tetrameter, mad violinist, even iambic tetrameter, very regular. Nahired palandiriel o galad o galadremin enorath fanuilos le linathon. Um, it's pretty regular, iambic tetrameter. And we have a rhyme scheme. Fourth Dauntless, exactly as you say. A, A, B, Gilthoniel, Miriel, Elenath, Diriel, Enoroth. A, A, B, A, B, C, C, Linathon, Ioron. Right? Good. So, interestingly, right? Interestingly, we have a poem which at first appears to be a very, I mean, this is alien, right? Uh, this is the first time, right? This is the first time in 
the book that we've had a completely foreign language poem? Is that true? I think that's true. I'm trying to think if I've forgotten any other examples. Yeah, so we've been reading a lot of poetry, but this is our first um this is our first poem. Now, the Elberth poem in the Shire Fourth Dauntless is translated in their heads. Um, I think there are some Elvish phrases in it, but it was mostly in the common speech. Certainly, we got the name of Elberth, um, not translated. Um, but, um, but yeah. So, um, Bricktails, I agree with you. If you're a 1954 reader, right, of this poem, we got nothing. I mean, we have we don't have any mechanism for translating this, right? After we get the appendices with the return of the king, we'll be slightly better equipped. Um, but you know, still, it it's it would be it would be a little non-trivial. But in any case, um, we don't even know how to pronounce it in 1954, right? Um, uh, so. So yeah, this is um, this is going to be totally alien to us. But here's the interesting. So, but so there are two interesting things. First, we do have an analog to this. Um, this is the second time we have heard elves bursting out into poetry. Right, that we get. The other time was Gildor in the Shire, and we did get I Elbereth uh, in that as well. Right. It's a song to Elbereth, says Frodo in prose, right? And so here we get another song to Elbereth. So I agree that an assumption that this is the Elvish version of that same poem, that is a very likely assumption. Yes. Oh, Elbereth Gilthoniel, we still remember we who dwell in this far land beneath the trees, thy starlight on the western seas. Yes. Yes. Um... The th anyway, but getting back to the form, the thing that really fascinates me about this poem is that although, it, again, slap there on the page, it looks really alien. We don't know almost any of these words, right? We have no idea. Well, we have almost no idea what this poem is saying. We do know what it's about, right? It's about Elbereth. Um, and we've been equipped enough to understand that, at least. Um, what Bilbo is about to tell Frodo in the next paragraph shouldn't be a surprise to us, even in 1954. But, despite the fact that it is alien, that is, in an alien language, the rhythm of it is very familiar. The rhythm and, mostly, the shape of it are very familiar. Um, it does not sound like... It does not sound different. It does not sound fundamentally different. It is in exactly the meter and very close to the rhyme scheme of Hobbit poetry, of the poetry that Bilbo's been making, that Frodo's been singing, right? A Elbereth Gilthoniel Silivran Pena Miriel Omenel Aglar Elenaf. I said we don't know how to pronounce it, even if, you know you didn't have the benefit of the appendices and you did some of the vowels wrong and you guessed wrong about some of the consonants uh, and things like that, you'd still get the rhythm, right? I mean, um, it, would be, it would be hard, I think. Especially because notice we get the accents, right? Um, Silivren, maybe you couldn't get. You know, maybe somebody would say, you know, Silivren or something like that. You might put the stress on the wrong syllable on that one if you didn't know better. Um, Pena Miriel, though, you can't do wrong because you've got Pena is pretty clear. And Miriel, you've got the accent on the first syllable, right, to tell you to stress that one. Omenel Aglar Elenath. Again, I, 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 it's hard to mispronounce that. So again, the point is... Um, Tolkien gives us this poem, which is relatively easy to read, not to understand, but to read, and it sounds like familiar poetry. It sounds like the Hobbit poetry that we've been hearing and reading, and that's really interesting. And, Simon, it does make you wonder whether or not Bilbo's standard style, the style that we've been calling Hobbit poetry, primarily iambic tetrameter, primarily alternating rhymes, right, is in fact derived uh, from Elvish poetry, right? So again, the point is that we get um, 
a poem which is which looks very alien but does not sound quite as alien as it otherwise would right it is in a familiar form tolkien could have gone further than this right he could have given us a poem which was complete which we didn't know how to even make sound like a poem right which would have sounded completely different than anything that we had read to this point and yeah mad violinist i agree we'll get there but he does not do that here right that is not the effect of this poem um this poem feels um this poem feels similar um based on its sound and even its rhyme scheme um yeah Rinrus, I agree. It's hard to put the stresses on the wrong syllables in Ah uh, Elbereth Gilthonio. Um, uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. This is accessible to hobbits, as it is, I think, uh, uh, Rayburns to the readers. Couple points that uh, a couple other points that I would make about this. First, notice the significance of this being in Elvish in the first place. That is. Gildor was singing in Elvish too. Right? But the song took shape in the minds of the hobbits. They understood it. Right? Like, Frodo translated it. Um, this is not translated. Right? There's a sense of... And, and that's interesting to me. Right? that there's something about this singing of this song which affects Frodo's ear differently than Gildor's song in the Shire. Um, is it because it was in the Shire? Is it because of Gildor's own intention? Did he, is, is there, did he want to be overheard? Right? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Is it just, is it... Are, are they doing it differently because it's here in the Hall of Fire? Is this, uh, is this song being sung by elves for elves, right? More or less exclusively? Is there th I'm not sure exactly what makes the difference. But the fact that Frodo hears and records this as elvish instead of as common speech um, seems to me important. And... I'm not sure how to take it. That is to say, we can take it in one of two ways, right? That is, it's either the elvish singers, or singer in this case, who's different, or doing something different, or it's Frodo who's different. And I'm not sure which one it is. I think all in all, I would, uh, I would suspect that it's the latter. It would make sense to me if something in this... It could be both, Simon. Conceivably, it could be both. Um... um Matt, that's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. Matt's reminding us about the crossing of the threshold, right? He's just crossed the threshold. He's just left the Hall of Fire, right? Um, Frodo has separated himself from the room, from the singing. He's, in a sense, when he hears this, he's on the outside looking in. Excuse me. He's on the outside looking in, right? Is that what makes the difference? I hadn't thought of that. That's, that seems very possible. Um, whereas, Matt, I guess you would say with Gildor's song, being that he is singing in the open air in the Hobbit's own Shire, right? Uh, Frodo coming along and uh, being an earshot of that is kind of included, right, uh, in that. Um, yeah, now, now, Chris, I know you're absolutely right uh, that Gildor does, was, says that he is unaware uh, of the presence of Hobbit listeners. Um, but I would say two things. First of all, um, Gildor does not have to be... Well, first of all, I, I'm uh, not 100% sure I absolutely believe Gildor completely in that conversation. But secondly, um, he doesn't have to know that they in particular, he doesn't have to be singing for Frodo personally to be singing with an attitude of generally embracing being overheard, right? Um, that's kind of more the argument that I'm making there. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, they're walking through the evening in the Shire, they're being very unsecretive when they're singing that song, 
right? Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but here's the here's the other possibility. That is, what if the change is, is the change in Frodo? And there are two different ways that that could be as well. Could it be that when Frodo meets Gildor in the Shire, that's his first elf encounter ever, right? Um, now, he th this is not the first time he's met elves. This is not the first time he's heard elves singing. Is there a sense in which now, through his own experience of elves, even potentially, uh, th through the influence of Bilbo's own song, that he, Frodo, the mortal, is able to kind of, is, is just distances himself from the song that he's hearing a little bit more, right? He's now listening to this, having heard the mortal song, which the elves are, you know, the elvish listeners are like, man, I don't know, right? You know, like, this is, uh, this is, this is mortal stuff, and I don't really get it. Is Frodo now, is, is in a sense, kind of turning around on this, right? Um, and saying, now Frodo is hearing elvish music, but differently. Before, he was merely the patient of elvish music, right? It was the agent, and he was, it was acting on him, right? Um, he was passive, to the elvish music before and was swept away in the flood of the music into that dream state, right, that he entered into. Um, now he is perhaps, and Matt, maybe this in a sense correlates with the threshold business, right? He has crossed over the threshold. Um, he has distanced himself, he physically distanced himself, right? But also perhaps in a sense, emotionally or even artistically. And now he's listening to this as elvish music, not just as music that's being performed by elves, right? Um, and so he hears it in elvish. He hears it's, he, he's now aware of the fact, more aware of the fact that this is, uh, this is a foreign language, right? But there's another possible reading of the It's Frodo reading, Right. And that would be. Of course, this is not being written down at the time. Um, could it be that we don't know for absolute certain that Frodo didn't understand it this time through? Perhaps the choice to give this in the original and to give Gildor's poem in translation is a choice made by Frodo after the fact when he's writing the book. Right. Could this reflect, could this be a kind of uh, Frodo's own desire, his own attempt to give his reader, the reader of the Red Book, right, a taste of what it is to hear elvish poetry? It could also be Findigil, conceivably, Mad Violinist. Um, I would tend not to think it's Findigil, and the it's and I don't have a real strong opinion about that. Um, but the reason I would vote against Findigil, King's writer, is that I would suspect that if it were Findigil, he would be consistent, right? Um, Frodo, I can see choosing to be inconsistent, choosing to give it in translation the first time, but in Elvish now, in order to gr grant that sense. Of, whereas I would think that if Findigil were, he would. He'd do it one way or the other. I can imagine him being like, oh, well, come on now. Let's like, let's, let's do this in proper, you know, Elvish language rather than, you know, translating it for the hobbits. Um, but, um, but the inconsistency feels more consistent <laughs> with Frodo, if that makes any sense. Um, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, good. Um, Yeah, good. So Christopher says, I want to, in, in common the first time, in Elvish this time, to point out the difference uh, in settings. Um, yeah, yeah, to, 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 to play critfic with Frodo, right? Imagining uh, what Frodo is thinking here. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that that, that, that kind of works. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back, Matt, to the point that you made. I, I find that increasingly persuasive. You know, we were just asking, what's the significance of the threshold? Like, why is why is our attention drawn to the fact that of that timing? Right. That just as they're crossing the threshold, they hear that. 
And it's interesting, right? That Frodo, having left the room, having distanced himself from it, having uh, there is there is the threshold of the room between them and the elves, right? They have moved on. Bilbo and Frodo have moved on um, and left that world of elvish song and you know music and poetry and and tales behind, right? And as soon as they do, the song that he hears is alien, right? Um, exactly, Simon. They exited the area of effect of the song, so uh, the enchantment no longer. Uh, yeah, there was like a little like a like a little red square on the ground, right? And they they, they got out of the out of the range. Uh, so yeah, he's not being enchanted by it anymore. Um. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, what does this mean? Well, before we go to a translation, because Tolkien gave a translation of this, um, what else, what other conclusions can we draw just from looking at it? What other conclusions can we draw just from looking at it? We have two sentences. Right? So we have... Yeah, we get punctuation, Mike. Exactly. Um, it does seem to be addressed to Elbereth. I mean, we don't know exactly what ah means, but it sounds... Ah, Elbereth Gilthoniel certainly sounds like a direct invocation. Um, uh, they are... They do seem to be directing their song to her. We get two sentences, both of which end with exclamation points. Right? Um, A, A, B, one sentence. A, B, C, C, second sentence. And yes, Torah Marthen, it does sound like O, Elbereth, like the Shakespearean single letter O at the beginning. Instead, we get the single letter A. And so yeah, that's exactly what it makes me think of. And I think it's the primary reason why I remember as a kid reading that first line and being like, okay, must they must be singing to Elbereth. Um, yeah, good. Brandon, there's something important about Fenuelos. It's capitalized, and the other beginnings of the lines are not other than the ones that are the beginning of sentences, right? So, first of all, can we make the general observation again? This seems to be obeying English syntactical laws. We got commas, we got exclamation points, we get capitalizations at the beginning of the two sentences, and we get capitalizations on what appears to be a proper na a proper noun, right? Elbereth Gilthonio. The, it seems to be Gilthoniel seems to be part of her name, um, and um, and then we get it again in Fanuelos. So maybe we would speculate based on the data that we have here that Fanuelos is another name, right? Um, okay, that's interesting. We don't, I think. Um, I don't think we have enough data, again, as certainly as 1954 readers, to um, draw too many more conclusions here. Um, we get the repetition in the last line. Nevayar si nevayaron. Right? Not 100% sure what that means, um, but the repetition is interesting. Um, it sounds. It gives. Sounds like a, a something in the way of a like a formulaic ending, right? Um, now, Rinrus is asking: have, have we seen anything that would suggest there's a language in this world that doesn't follow English syntactical laws? Though, uh, not necessarily. I, I just mean. What I mean is. All of the conventions that we're used to are being followed here. And that's not something that we would necessarily assume in a foreign language, right? I mean, like, you know, I mean, goodness, even like Spanish doesn't use punctuation marks the same way that we do, right? And Spanish is a heck of a lot closer to English than, uh, than you know, um, uh, Tinderin is to 
Westron, right? So, um, uh, so anyway, um, uh, that's 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 what I mean. The conventions are seem exactly the same, um, uh, which again seems to be an effort on Tolkien's part to make this less alien. It is alien, but not alien, right? Um, we don't know what this means, but the more you look at it, the more it sort of seems like um, uh, you should, in a sense, right? Uh, like we're n maybe we shouldn't be that far from being able to figure it out. Um, Nachired Palandiriel, O Galath Remen Enoroth, Fanuelos, Le Linathon, Nevair si Nevairon. Nachired Palandiriel, O Galath Remen Enoroth, Fanuelos, Le Linathon, Nevair si Nevairon. I don't know what it means, but again, it's it's kind of closer, right? Um. Yeah. Yeah, good. Brandon is saying if I'm thinking if it's a if it's a prayer or hymn to Elbereth, that last line is something like Amen and Amen. Yet it sounds like something sort of formulaic like that. I agree. Um, okay. So again, one of the major trends that we see in the presentation of this poem is that different but same, right? Alien but not off putting. Alien but inviting in a sense, right? By its sound, by its conventions. Um, this is a poem that invites us not to, um, not to just dismiss it, not to just look past it, not just to be like, oh yeah, whatever, that's really weird, right? Um, yeah. And Mad Violinist, I agree that the alienness shows some in the rhyme scheme, but not much. I mean, we, I don't think we have heard a Hobbit poem with precisely this rhyme scheme. You know, A A B A A A A B A B C C. Um, it's different from what we've normally seen, but it's not like wildly different, right? It's not like the rhyme functions in a different way. It's not. I mean, it's still terminal rhyme with, uh, you know. I, I mean, we've seen couplets before, right? And we have alternating rhyme most of the way, so there are variations. It's not. It doesn't exactly work the same way that ho 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 to the bottle I go works, right? But it's it's kind of more alike than different in that way. Um, and for Dauntless, I agree, it's a lot more familiar than Bilbo's rhyme scheme and Arendel was a mariner. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so let's um let's look at the translation. O Elbereth Star Kindler, white glittering slants down sparkling like jewels from the firmament, the glory of the star host. This is uh, a literal, a very literal translation by Tolkien. Um, I think this translation is this is the translation that Tolkien provided uh, for when Donald Swan did the musical setting of Tolkien's poetry much later in Tolkien's life, and he provided this. Uh, this translation um, for the for the, the the book that was published with the the musical um, release from the firmament, the glory of the star host, to remote distance, far having gazed from the tree tangled middle lands, Fanuelos, to thee I will chant on this side of ocean, here on this side of the great ocean. Okay. Um, yes, JJ, good. The translation is not trying to be poetic at all, right? This translation is at the extreme end. So whenever you're translating, right, you have to make a choice, right? A choice between trying to capture, like, the actual implications of the word that is used and trying to capture the whole larger sense, right? And, um... He is making. He is on the extreme side. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, a, a classic example of this, of course, is you know, so people who know um, English Bible translations, 
you've got like the King James and the NIV. The NIV gives the translation in modern English and it's throughout, it's like, this is what the text is trying to get across, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to take what I believe the text is trying to get across and I'm going to say that in modern English. Whereas the King James is pretty far on the other end of the spectrum and is saying, no, I'm going to give you a translation of what these words mean and let you put together what it means. And sometimes the King, so sometimes the NIV has a translation that's pretty far removed from what the actual Greek says in the New Testament. And sometimes the King James has a verse which follows the Greek very, very closely and is almost unintelligible in English. Beautiful, but almost unintelligible in English, like the business about the bowels and mercies. What on earth does that even mean? Well, it's literally what the Greek says. Um, but anyway, Tolkien is going on the far end, like way past the King James in this, right? What he's trying to do, it seems, it seems to me in this translation, is to convey, like, I think that this translation, this is not designed in any way to give us a sense of what the poem is really doing, right? To give us a sense of the poetry. Why? Because the poetry is, is here. This is the poetry, right? In the original. Um, we're not, you could never substitute this for this, right? You can never substitute the English for the Sindarin in this, po in, for this poem, right? All the Sindarin does is give you a kind of gloss, um, on the Sindarin words. Ah, Elbereth Gilthonio. Oh, Elbereth Starkindler. Okay, so we know that Elbereth is her actual name, right? So that's not translated. Gilthonio is not her name, it's a title, and it means Star Kindler. Okay, great. Silivren Pena Muriel. White, in parentheses, glittering, slants down, sparkling like jewels. So, Silivren Pena Muriel. Those three words translate to white glittering. So glittering would be silivren, right? But it implies whiteness, right? So he's got the par parenthetical white glittering. Slants down would then be penna, and Muriel would be sparkling like jewels, right? Um, okay. All right. So again, notice we're getting the concepts associated with each of the words. We're not, he's not translating, right? Then we've got Omenel Aglar Elenath. Omenel, from the firmament. Omenel Aglar Elenath. The glory, Aglar, of the star host. Omenel Aglar Elenath. So Elenath is the star host, right? El, we should already maybe be beginning to recognize, meaning star, uh, and host with the Elenoth, the e e Elenoth ending there, right? Okay. Um, and then Nahired Palandiriel. Too remote distance, so Nahired, too remote, so the, the Na prefix me is a preposition meaning to right to what hired remote distance far having gazed palandiriel so we get both what the meaning of the word and we're also getting its uh we're, we're getting the shape of the verb there right far having gazed so it's no wait not it's present perfect progressive that verb right um, and right, Brandon, we don't yet know the word palantir, but if we paid very careful attention to this poem, we would recognize that phoneme, uh, or that morpheme, rather, uh, when we get to the palantir later on, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, o Galavremen Enoroth. From... So now we've seen O twice, right? O Menel Aglar Elanoth and O Galav Remen Enoroth. Um, so O means from, it turns out, right? From the tree-tangled middle lands. 
So Galavremen means tree tangled Enrath, middle lands. Okay. Fanuelos, to thee I will chant. Now he doesn't translate Fanuelos. And it's capitalized, and so therefore from those two things we can presumably assume that that is another name, right? The literal translation of Fanuelos would be something like, hang on, we've heard it before, right? Um, there was a similar shape uh, in Gildor's song, Snow White. Snow White, Snow White, we sing to thee. Um, Fanulos is the word, the elvish word, which was being translated in Frodo's head as Snow White. Right? Um, Fanulos, to thee I will chant. Fanulos le linathon. Okay. Um, to thee I will chant. Again, we're getting the... Notice how we're we're learning conjugation here too, linathon. So we're getting an I will chant. So that's a that's a first person singular future verb. Cool, right? Nevair si nevairon. On this side of the ocean. So the 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 nev means presumably uh, on like on this side of, right? On this side of is what that pronoun seems to mean. On this side of ocean, nevair. So ir is ocean. See nevairon. So on this side of ocean, here, on this side of, wait, what's ayron? The great ocean. Aha. Okay. Great. Um, exactly. So the suffixes aren't noun cases. They're verb conjugation indicators would seem to be. Exactly. So, you got to love this, right? Uh, Tolkien doesn't... In, ask to provide a translation, Tolkien doesn't provide a translation. T Tolkien provides a key for learning Elvish, <laughs> right? <laughs> With the help of this, you can learn quite a bit of Elvish grammar and syntax, right? Notice all the, the I mean, all the, like, the prepositions we learned and things, right? There's a lot that we could, using this as a key, we could, you know, if, with this as our little Rosetta Stone, uh, we could put together quite a bit of stuff, right? Um, so anyway, I, I thought that was actually really pretty adorable. Um, so let's kind of go back and forth then and think a little bit about the meaning. O Elbereth Gilthonio, right? So, Silivren Penamirio, this business about glittering whiteness slanting down, sparkling like jewels, um, it sounds like a description of the stars, right? And yet, coming right after, it sounds like a description of her, actually, that she is being compared to the stars, or rather, the other way around, the stars are being compared to her, right? Um, from the firmament, the glory of the star host. Um, the first sentence, therefore, um, notice in the way that he's translated this, notice what that first sentence is lacking based on his literal word-for-word -word translation. Yeah, Brandon, a verb. A verb. Um, I, slants down is probably our verb, right? Um, white glitteringness, right? Slants down, sparkling like jewels from the firmament, the glory of the star host, right? Um, but we don't get much verb there, right? It's not like Elbert doesn't seem to be doing anything and we don't get any like we sing to the kind of action there, right? The first sentence a Elbereth Gilthoniel Silivren Pena Miriel O Menel Aglar Elenath right? Is just praise for her and who she is for the light that comes down from it's, it's a praise of the stars and through the stars and with the stars themselves as an image right? Of Elbereth herself, 
right? And then, to remote distance, far having gazed from the tree-tangled middle lands, Fanuelos, to thee I will chant. We finally get our subject and verb, right? The second one, the second sentence is about the singer, right? Lelinathon, that's the central action. That's the subject and verb, right? Of the, well, subject, verb, and direct object, right? Le is the direct object um, of this sentence. I will sing to thee, Snow White, Fanuelos, right? Uh, under what circumstances? I will sing of thee to remote distance, far having gazed from the tree-tangled middle lands, right? So I am in the tree-tangled middle lands. It says, so notice that the, 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 the last line, and the antepenultimate line, which so both those the, the 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 last line and the third and the, the the third to last line, which surround that second to last line, which has the uh, which has the subject in it, right? Fanulos lelinathon is the main idea of that second sentence. The last line and the antepenultimate line, both of them describe the circumstances of the singer, right? I am in the tree tangled middle lands on this side of the ocean, here on this side of the great ocean, right? So it talks about the separation. Just as the first sentence talks about, notice we've got the, the light coming down, right? The light descending. Um, uh, the, the action is all on Elbereth's part, right? What she gives, the light that comes from the stars that were her gift, the light which is again by... Uh, uh, in parallel, it would seem, um, her own action reaching down towards the earth, right? Covering the entire earth as the, the stars cover, uh, you know, the entire sky above all of the lands. Um, the second sentence from the perspective of the Elvish singer emphasizes the, the restriction, right? I am on the, I am on this, I am on this side of the ocean, here on this side of the great ocean, right? Distance, greater distance. I am surrounded by, in the tree-tangled land, right? Like I am enmeshed in this land, in this tree-tangled land, the tree-tangled middle lands, right? Um, and then the Palindirio, right? Talks about seeing from afar, right? I can see you. I can look towards you, Elbereth, and the stars that you placed in the firmament, um, but from far away, right? I can only look upon it from far away because I'm in the tree-tangled middle ends on the other side of the Great Sea, right? And good, Brandon, exactly. The tree-tangled thing, it, it can be hard to even see the stars, right? Sometimes we might be so encased, so, so entangled um, in the encumbrances of Middle Earth that we can't even see the stars, that your light won't even reach us, right? But yet, from afar, we sing to thee, right? Um, it's, a, it's a lovely little poem, right? And Matt, absolutely a fascinating companion piece to Bilbo's, right? Um, if Bilbo is giving us the mortal point of view, or rather more specifically, the point of view of a mortal who comes among, you know, the undying ones, right? This is giving us this poem, uncoincidentally, the first poem given to us in Elvish seems to be giving us more of the Elvish perspective, certainly the exiled elf perspective, um, than we've heard really anywhere. Right. Um, we got some of it. Um, yeah, Fourth Dauntless is quoting again from Gildor. We still remember we who dwell in this far land beneath the trees, thy starlight on the western seas. Right. Um, this verse does not talk about remembering. Right. It talks about seeing from afar. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, fun stuff, right? Uh, uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, I'm making my, 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting, Cecilia. Cecilia makes the point that calling the Middle Lands tree tangled, um, if we permit a memory of what we know uh, of the Silmarillion, um, contrasted with the two trees, perhaps, right? Um, the t- the tree tangled state of the of the Middle Lands of Middle Earth um, is uh, is very different, right, from the light of the trees uh, back in Dalinor. That's that's really interesting. Um, yeah, and I like Cecilia's uh, uh, paraphrase. Um, Even though I am very far away from you, I will sing to you. Yes, there's almost... That second sentence does seem to have almost that kind of... Um, that kind of a, a, a faith emphasis, right? Despite the distance. But st- despite my keen awareness of the distance between us. How far I am separated from you. Um, I, I still... I still will sing. I will chant. Le Linathon. Um, yeah, very good. Okay. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm making my... Do we have time for one more slide? Um, uh... Face. Um... Nah. Nah, I think I'm gonna... I think I'm gonna... I'm gonna wait on it. Um, after this... We have three more slides in chapter one of book two. I'm going to call it next week. We're going to finish. We're actually going to finish this chapter next week. Fearless prediction. I think it's going to happen. Three passages. I think we can do it. And they're, and they're fairly short passages. I could have squeezed it into two slides. Uh, but... Um, but yeah, no, I think uh, I think it's I think it's I think it's very possible that we could get through chapter two of book or chapter one of book two in only 31 sessions, which all things considered is really fairly speedy. Exactly. Aranas. Yeah. 31 sessions. That's it. Um, so, yeah. So we'll, we'll we should be able to do that. So by Baymoot, by the time I go out to uh, to Berkeley, California, I will be. Uh, we'll be done with the discussion of chapter one, probably. Um, all right. So we'll see what we can do. Um, so we're going to, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mad Violinist says maybe we'll be sighing for 31 sessions, uh, while in the midst of the council of Elrond. I, I, I will be interested. I'm, I'm, I am less convinced than most of you that we are going to take like, twice as long to do the Council of Elrond. We might. Um, it's very long, uh, and there's a lot to talk about there, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I will be interested to see. My prediction, for what it's worth, is that we will go through the Council of Elrond at a higher rate. Um, that is, at a, at a at, at like, more... More, more, more words per class, a higher rate of words per class than we did this chapter. So, um, uh, anyway, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that's the plan. Okay. So thanks everybody. I'm going to, we're going to switch over and we're going to do our field trip. Um, and, uh, we're going to, um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say good night to the folks on Twitter. Thanks for joining me on Twitter, and I will uh, see you guys next week for our hopefully grand finale of uh, chapter one. So good night to them. We're gonna switch over, of course. Uh, feel welcome to join us at Twitch.tv/signumu. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So um. Uh, what did, Evil Doctor Cannon? There is a little bit of poetry, admittedly, in Chapter Two, but not very much. Bilbo's going to do his Aragorn poem again, um, but we've already talked about that, so we won't spend that much time on that one. Um, we do get the, um, we do get the, um, we do get the Faramir poem. That's going to be the biggest one, I think. Um, yeah, exactly, Edith, the dream poem, the dream prophecy. Um, Arden Crayon, 
it's not that we're not going to linger a little bit, certainly, over Gandalf speaking in the black tongue, but I bet we'll do that in one session. We won't spend any longer on that than we did on the, uh, you know, on the cinder in here. Um, so, good. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so tonight is a special field trip. So last week uh, we went on a field trip here in Landreval, and we're doing we're on Landreval again two weeks in a row, and and we're doing this uh, for a uh, for a special reason uh, because um, we have uh, we have a special uh, field trip tonight uh, because um, there are two things that I. Um, uh, that I want to say about this. So first of all, um, we did a uh, drawing for which the grand prize was to be able to choose your own field trip. Remember I talked about that before? And the first thing I want to say about that uh, is that uh, the winner of that drawing last year was Katriana. Uh, and Katrina and I didn't connect about this for a long time. We didn't even talk about it until I think it was at um, Sunshine Moot in March that we talked about it. And then I lost track of things and everything. So we didn't get around to it for a really long time. So we're finally now on like the anniversary uh, of the drawing, uh, getting around to doing Katriana's request uh, of a custom field trip after exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and the second thing I want to say about that is... For a couple weeks in a row now, I have forgotten to do the drawing for this year. I keep meaning to do it. So I'm going to do the drawing right now before we leave because that totally should happen. Um, so uh, I'm going to do the drawing. And when I do this drawing, I'm going to do this drawing in a way which is going to um, uh, and, and it's going to it's going to I'm really quite hoping that it is going to take less than a year uh, the second time uh, to do this. So we have, remember the uh, the terms of um, the terms of the drawings were that um, uh, we're going to draw three winners um, and of our three winners uh, we're gonna, the, the, the first two, the, or rather the second and third prize winners will get either a free uh, ticket to the regional moot of your choice, uh, and or you'll get a uh, an, an asynchronous um, or an anytime audit um, uh, uh, entry. So that is access to any of our asynchronous access to any of our Signum courses that you would like. The grand prize winner gets those things also, but in addition, um, in addition gets. Um, gets to choose a field trip of their own. So, yeah, exactly. So, Matt, I'm getting my dice out here. So, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm doing a die roll here. Let's see. Okay. And our third price our third place winner is Phil Boswell. Phil Boswell, my traditional lore monkey on the Griffith stream, uh, is our third place winner. Congratulations, Phil. Our second place winner is Kevin Lucas. Kevin Lucas is our second place winner. Okay, I should. I'm gonna. I'm making a mark here. Okay, making a mark there and making a mark there. Very good. Okay, and our grand prize winner. Our grand prize winner is. Marilyn Kinch. Marilyn Kinch is our grand prize winner. Congratulations, Marilyn. That is excellent. Okay. So Marilyn Kinch is our grand prize winner. Phil Boswell and Kevin Lucas are our third and second prize uh, place winners, respectively. There you go. Congratulations. I love doing uh, dice rolls here uh, for these kinds of things. Okay. Now, but with that done... Um, I, uh, I'm going to, we're going to do, so we're not going to do, as I say, we're not going to do a regular field trip tonight. I'm going to go with 
Katriana, and she had made us a, a particular request of an instance that we can do, which is cool because I haven't been doing instances uh, with Narnian. And also, I have to admit, on a gameplay level, is likely to be a little challenging because Narnian, being only a talker and having never adventured anywhere, is a complete wuss and pushover. Um, you guys will remember a couple weeks ago how Narnian was getting killed by, like, level 40 dudes. Um out in Sarnur. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, very good. Um, oh, hey, uh, uh, Kevin, is that you up there in the Twitch chat? Congratulations. Very good. Um, okay, yeah, so, Katriana, do you want to, why don't you, um, why don't you, can you fellow with me, Katriana? Um, and then if, if you want to bring others along, that's awesome. Um, so, um, that way, yeah. If you if you join with me, then you can you can be in charge of the party. There, okay. Excellent. All right. Very good. Because and I think we can just start this one from the from the instance finder, right? Uh, so that'll be that'll be pretty easy. Okay, yeah, so, like, this is the field trip where I'm not, like, actually leaving the lore, the lore hall, because uh, I'll be using the, 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 uh, the instance finder. So, Katriana, why don't you, do, um, and I'm forgetting, so I should tell you what we're going to be doing. Um, so, the instance that Katriana requested uh, is the, uh, oh, I'm going to forget the place. Uh, we're going to do one of the two Eregian um, uh, Ringforge instances uh specifically we're going to do the uh uh the library one um we wanted to look at the uh the 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 Aregian stuff and the the ruins of the the ring forges of Celebrimbor. um uh so that's where we're going to be going um oh excellent we've got some uh we've got some wonderful support here i i think with a couple level 120s there uh narnian will not be needed for firepower in this uh in this instance, so that's pretty cool. Is that a three-man, Simon? That's what I was wondering. I, I think we might have too many people for that. Um, yeah, I think we might need to pare it down to just one other with the two of us, Katriana. Um, let me uh, let me check there. Forgetting which one. Yeah, that's the instance finder. Um, uh -huh. Right, non-scaling. Let's hope I can do it. Where did it go? Did I miss it? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, hang on. Oh, is it because we have too many people in the fellowship? It says like everybody else is not able, eligible to run the encounter. Um, yeah, it is a three. It is a three man. Yep. Yeah, Simon is of course correct. Um, yeah, it's great out for me, but I don't think it's because. Are there any prereqs for it that I'm missing? I didn't think there were, but maybe I was wrong about that. Um, so yeah, what, Katriana, why don't you decide, um, yeah, I mean, others can watch on Twitch, yeah, it's no big deal. Um, okay, it's just grayed out because it's too, because of too many people, okay. So, Katriana, why don't you, why don't you, we'll, we'll just, uh, keep one thug, perhaps, um, and, uh, and then, because it's, is it scaling or non-scaling? Oh, it's scaling. Yeah, <clears throat> it is going to scale. So let's just not do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Katrian, I think you're doing it with uh, with Morniel, right? Which is level 80. So, yeah, if we scale it to 80 or, or lower, and then just we will only need one level 120 with us to make that one pretty easy, I think. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that should be that should be pretty. Uh, that should be pretty easy. Okay. Cool. It's a level 50 minimum, Gravity. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Hi, Gravity. Good to see ya. 
looking forward to seeing gravity at Baymoot too. That'll be fun. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. We can take Kiriana. No problem. Yeah. Um, yep, that's right. Gravity and levity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to looking forward to seeing you guys at Bay Moot. Uh, the regional moots are such an awesome opportunity to be able to get together with folks who live in different parts of the country. I know sometimes people are able to make it to uh, to Myth Moot, our big annual gathering in the end of June in Washington, in the Washington D.C. area. Um, but um, uh, but of course, for those who aren't able to travel, and even for those who can, it's another opportunity to uh, uh, to get together. So cool. All right. Um, so I'm gonna. There we go. Now we're blue. Excellent. So why don't you start it up, Kiriana? Or sorry, I mean Morning Morniel is the uh, Katriana is the the alt that you're in with here. All right. There we go. Hang on, I always like to read the text. The library at Tamir Dain once held much of the knowledge of the early age and withstood the brunt of Sauron's attack against Eregion. Though much of the surviving lore was carried away by Elrond Half-Elven, the forces of Angmar now seek the remnants. Right, that's the, there's our plot. Okay. So this was the center of lore. The library at Tham Myrdain once held much of the knowledge of the early ages and withstood the brunt of Sauron's attack against Aregion. Though much of the surviving lore was carried away by Elrond Half-Elven, okay. the force of Angmar now seeks the remnants. Right. All right. Excellent. So it's Galadriel who is... Uh, who is narrating that. That's interesting. Oh. I have unmuted Catriona so she can uh, chat with you and chat. Oh, great. Yeah. Excellent. So wait, Catriona, can I hear you? Hello. There we go. Excellent. Very good. Okay. All right. So what were those el those uh, or elves, uh, elves, those orcs saying they're, oh, they're threatening to, they're just trying to get their, minions to find more things, right? So they're searching for something. Okay. All right. Well, let's get down to business here. Look at the doors. Let's see. That's really interesting. Notice how the doors are a very similar... Um, it looks kind of Gondorian, doesn't it? With like the, like the, the, the swan wing thing that we often get at the top of towers. And who's this flanking the doors? Oh, is that Gilgalad? That was what I thought when I was here the other night. Yeah. That kind of tarnished. Yeah, the shield uh, is sort of tarnished, right? No, we're not getting the stars on the shield, but the shield is the same shape. Look really close, you can kind of see some stars on it. Right, right, like where they might have been, yeah. It's almost like uh, maybe they were made of silver or something and have been chiseled off, perhaps. Because this place has been sacked. I bet that's it. You can see the markings, right, where the silver stars used to be. I bet that's what happened. bet that's what happened. Um, in fact, it even looks like you can see the grain of the wood um, as if it was made out of a, like a large wooden shield, which was then covered in silver with the silver stars um because the you know the countless stars of heaven's shield a field were mirrored in his silver shield so the surface of the shield would have been silver uh and the stars on it right would have been but then they uh, they being like the looters right like stripped off all the silver okay notice how he's got that like pharaonic uh 
headdress thing going on there attached to his hood. That's kind of interesting. Also notice how non-pointy his ears are. Or leaf-shaped. Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of a point, but it's very subtle. Much more subtle than we've seen uh, sometimes in other places, like on actual elves. Okay. And we have a symmetrical statue on the other side. But anyway, you, you see what I mean about the doors? How they look like the top of a, of a Gondorian statue? That's really interesting. The one thought I had when I was going through the other night with my friend was it reminds me a lot of some of the tombs in Enuminous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm like seeing echoes of a Numenorean sort of architecture in places, but then also with a heavy o- elven overlay. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you would have thought that this... Um, uh, you would have thought that the, that this place would have been. I mean, this is uh, this is not the heart of Elvendom on Earth, uh, at least not according to Aragorn. But um, but I mean, it was pretty elvish back in the day, right? I mean, this is the center of Celebrimbor's power, um, and you know, this very building would have been very close to the very center of uh, um, of um, of elvish power. You know, of 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 like Noldoran power in uh, um, in 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 Middle Earth, certainly of Celebrimbor's own power, and yet I agree that we can already see some interesting similarities uh, to like Gondorian motifs, and then we've got more statues here. We should probably. Who are these dudes? Oh, they're pale folk. Yeah, those guys are really creepy. They're like the sort of. Gollum esque sort of enslaved hobbits. Yeah. Yeah, you see them in some of the Angmar instances and areas. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're they're gonna aggro on us even though we're the gray, right? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm gonna have to uh Actually, yeah, okay. Alright, as long as I think I have got my uh don't I have my... No? Okay, my... Uh, sorry, my... Cat is not being very proactive here. Let me... Uh, let's see, what do I have him set on? Guard mode. No, 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 no. I want him set on aggressive mode. Uh, yeah. Flag's been bad tonight. Great. Okay. Yeah, no worries. All right, I'm just trying to set it up so that my cat does most of the work here. Um, <laughs> as said, almost nobody ever. Um, uh, but anyway, um, I mean, how many, how many human cat, in how many human cat relationships does the cat ever do the majority of the work? Um, cats are normally t- way too cunning for that. Um, okay, so we've got these. I really like these little reading pedestals here. Some beautiful illuminated manuscripts. Very cool. Purple lights, which suggests something like Fanorian lamps. And then, of course, we have these statues. Now, I think... Okay, this guy with the mace or the scepter. All right, I'm going to come back to him. I'm going to come back to him. Wait a second. I recognize these statues. These are the statues from Dueland. Aren't Mm -hmm. they? That's what I thought. Yeah. So this is, if we're correct, this is, is, what's his face? This is Alendo. With the scepter, not with a mace. And the shield, yeah. Yeah, these were like the mysteriously human statues that we were looking at. Right, and here's the sword. Right, but yeah, yeah, those were the statues that were looking off towards, vaguely towards Anuminous. Uh, this guy has 20 ears like the Gilgalad statue. 
Yeah, but less. I remember when we were looking at it before, we were thinking that his ears were suspiciously less pointy than we saw in other elves. I wonder if we can find a genuinely, unquestionably, because these are, yeah, these are all that same statues. Um, an unquestionably elvish statue, like a Luthien statue or something like that. Um, that we could compare the Celebrimbor statue. You've got to think we got to find the Celebrimbor statue sooner or later. Yeah, I think it's around here. Right. And then we can do a, we can do a side-by-side -side ear comparison there. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm looking for any other indication. Those symbols in the ceiling are interesting. We've seen that before. Those circular like rose window patterns almost there in the middle um okay however i'm not paying a lick of attention where should we go we should uh, just does it matter which direction we go uh, straight ahead i think is but okay straight ahead nope yeah and here's me here we go oh, i think Hi those there. are just the little alcoves that there's nothing in okay for the cases Okay, just bookcases and stuff? Oh, right, yeah. Okay, we've got bookcases here. Got a few scrolls as well as the codices, which fill most of the most of really nicely stocked bookcases and well-preserved, for crying out loud. It seems like most of the bookshelves we ever see in Locher are half empty. These are quite full in comparison. Yeah, apparently Elrond left a lot here. Yeah, exactly. He really, you know, apparently he'd, he'd already read all of these. This, this, this look, this like metal riveted above marble look is really kind of interesting. It's rather, well, unusual in anybody's architecture, frankly. I mean, where we see that those kind of like relatively heavy metal plates welded onto things is in like orcish architecture more often than anywhere else. Yeah, my friend commented there's, we haven't got to it in this class yet, but there's that place in the Troll Shaws that's part of the epic where um, Narmaleth was held captive. Yes, yes, yes. I think inside, it's a name yeah, of it yeah, we, we can go inside, but yes. Delasad. Yes, in Delasad. He thought the yeah. architecture here reminded him a lot of that place. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. And that would be an interesting parallel. That was an elvish place, too. Probably roughly contemporaneous. Yeah, probably. There we go. Okay. Interesting carving on the floor, though. Carving on the floor? Which ones? Oh, oh the one right here in oh, the, the big thing. one. Yeah. A little obscured by the debris or whatever. Right. Huh. It's almost like a large version of those little circles you saw on the ceiling. In the ceiling, yes. Yes. Oh, let's see. Are there any of them in here? Probably not when I want one. Um, whereas here we can see a little more clearly. Is that a dragon? Or is it a bird? Could be a swan with a funny head. Could be a dragon with a funny tail. I think it's a good dragon, yeah. I agree, likely a bot. I I think that's a. I think, it, well, it's more. It's a, the the neck suggests it's a pretty serpentine dragon, but Tolkien's dragons generally are fairly serpentine. Okay. I'm try, I'm thinking about this for like. You know this 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 four leaf pattern here in the middle, with the dragons around the side. 
what, presumably eight of them, two in each quadrant. Huh. That's just not a pattern I recall seeing anywhere. I think we're supposed to pick this up. What is this? An old text found within the... Wait, hang on. Found within the library, some fragments of ring lore may yet be gleaned. Okay. I mean, I don't know that we want to do that, but... It's one of the deeds here, I think. I see. Okay. I found the ancient volume. Great. Yeah, I have almost no memory of what we're actually meant to be doing in here. Um, here's the big courtyard. Ooh, lovely. Oh, that tree is really... Okay, open to the sky. And it looks like always open to the sky. We can see vaulting up there, but none of it looks like it was arching over this. That looks like it all went out and around to the sides. So this was always a... Uh, Oh, yeah, we should probably uh, set them on fire or something. Okay, I'm a lore master. I'm meant to set things on fire, right? That's what's supposed to happen. Um, okay. Oh, but that leaves smudges. Oh, I, I won't do that again. We don't want to mar the upholstery. Okay, I mean, not that there's upholstery here. It's flagstones. But still, the point remains. Okay. I love how that tree is growing on top of the rock. That is super cool. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, Sam, you're absolutely right that open spaces like this would create moisture problems for the books, but proper manuscript preservation practices have not been... Um, widely observed among the elves of Middle-earth within the Lotro universe, as far as we can see. Um, so this was an open... Uh, we don't see any... Oh, I do see crows attacking me. But anyway, um, we don't see any ruins of, like, floor in here. So this presumably was, uh, even though that's... Over all the way over here is under the overhang. Presumably was um, open lawns and things here. Those rocks look original. That tree, I think, is awesome, but I don't quite get. Like, did they grow the tree there? If so, it's the only tree. I wonder if it sprang up in later years. Yeah, it almost looks like it must have done. Oh, and there's statues of Celebrimbor all the way around the side. Yeah, they got a bolt deal on them or something. Yeah, exactly. I think they must have done. Um, yeah, it was probably an embarrassing moment when, like, you know, the sculptor was like, I completed a statue of you, Master Celebrimbor, and he's like, oh, okay, um, that's very kind of you, I'll take that. And then he's like, okay, I also made, like, 45 duplicates of it. Would you also like those too? And he like felt he couldn't say no. Um, but of Here course, on, have a couple. Take to Rivendell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, take one to Rivendell. No, no, no. Take two. Take three to Rivendell. Um, but the interesting effect there, right, is that we have Celebrimbor holding up the ring, a ring, right, in each case. So you've got like a whole bunch of rings facing out into the middle of this courtyard, which creates an interesting kind of effect right standing in the middle um there's all. some kind of lighting on the statues yeah, there too there is I like that's an interesting effect half of them are in light and half of them are in darkness it's kind of lovely allegorically right as you know Celebrimbor's actions in creating the elvish rings of power were Good actions, though though influenced and slightly corrupted by uh, the evil influence of Sauron. So the whole half of the symbolic Celebrimbors are in light and half in darkness thing is kind of cool. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, presumably it's just a relic of what was in the past, but it's interesting anyway. 
Okay, we can't carry on going forward, right? So we have to go off to one side here. Back through. All right, there we go. Let's gently set fire to some things. Okay, there we go. Without burning any books or... Okay. Wow. All these books that Elrond did not want to take with him. What did he take to Rivendell? I mean, are there whole bookcases missing, presumably? Because, wow. <laughs> like we have bought, says he took all the anime and left the books of lore. Um... He could have made photocopies, Edith, that's right, very carefully, without damaging the spines of any of the books. Ooh, we're up on the second level. Okay. Maybe we can get closer to the uh, to the light source. Can we get up to the top level? C can Not we... that I've seen, but... Can we get among the Celebrimbors? Oh, hey, come on, guys. Seriously, can you please... Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, looking more closely from up here, I'm trying to figure out more certainly how the sea wing goes. Yes, the arches that we can see that are broken off appear to be going sideways. So as if it was making just this like continuously rising amphitheater around this central spot, but it would have been open to the air. And then we get these column things, the ones that rise straight in the background, which I don't I don't really get. Some of the elven buildings were open, but still had, like, ribs of a vaulting over top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is what so I was looking for. So maybe it's like for. the stubs of vaults that went over, but was still open. Well, I don't think they went over. I, it looks like, I mean, if I'm seeing it correctly, it looks like they're going... They're going like sideways around the diameter of the circle rather than pointing radially in towards the center of the circle. Um, maybe they held some kind of fabric awning at one point in time. Maybe. Maybe. Kind of the Roman Colosseum used to have right. awning. Right, right. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. Or something even more elaborate up there. It's interesting to me that the architect so so some of the touches like this this gold um I don't know if it's inlay uh but anyway this gold inlay on the on the on the stonework here is the most Aregian looking thing that we've seen so far most similar to the uh, to the rest of the Noldor the Noldoran architecture here in Aregian um but we we've seen very little of that kind of thing. So is this where we came from? No, we're still going up. Good. Are these pillars like the ones that are the winery in Eridluin? Wait, which pillars? Hang on, let me go down. I was starting to go up the stairs. Oh, these the ones wooden. there. No. No, I don't think so. I think these are different from the winery pillars. Yeah, pretty sure they are different don't think we saw pillars exactly like this in Arid Lewin. Well, it is quite an amalgam of styles here. It is. Which, again, I wouldn't have expected. I would have expected this to be as elvish and like Noldoran as the day is long. Right? But, um... It's yeah. very distinct from the rest of the Aregian architecture, aside from these exactly. golden work things. Exactly. And that I would not have expected that at all um all right i'm headed up oh is this a boss dude it looks like a boss yeah dude. he's commander, the big boss of the simpson commander pistor there okay hang on will he let me look at banners before oh whoa, okay hang on here's a close-up of calibrimbor see it's not gonna start monologuing before okay no no not 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 here I haven't crossed the boss threshold yet. Trying to look at his ears. Okay, see, those ears look significantly more pointed, I think, than the ones on those statues in the entry hall. Is that just me? 
No, definitely. I think that those ears are more pointy. And more elongated overall. Yes. Yes. By the way, the length of the handle on his ring hammer I've always found kind of interesting, too. I mean, with that length of hammer, it looks like he's really ready to take a, a like a much more significant whack at that ring of power than I would have expected him to, honestly. I mean, you know, normally I kind of associate like tap, tap, tap with jewelry hammers, you know? Um, but that is not a tap, tap, tap kind of hammer. Maybe it's exaggerated for the statue. Like if he's holding a little tiny little like ball peen hammer, it would look silly on a statue. So he needs to have a more, you know, manly hammer there on his statue. But um, in order for you to be able to easily tell that it's a that it's a um, that it's a sta that it's a hammer. So maybe it's just for visual effect. You think the statue is life size or a little bit large? I think it's a little bit larger, but still even so proportionally. I mean, the handle yeah, of that is almost as long as his arm. You wanted you to be sure what it was. Yeah, perhaps so. Perhaps so. Unlike the ring, which is, of course, I mean, of course, it would look a little silly if you were holding a ring the size of a, you know, like a, like a, you know, a, a bracelet sized ring, <laughs> a bracelet size, right. Or, or, you know, like a life preserver or something. Um, so even though it's hard to see, you can still see that it's a ring. But see, that's kind of cool, though, because you can infer that it's a ring, right? Even if you can't see it exactly. And if you can contrive to look more closely, you can see that it's a ring. Um, but uh, actually, the difficult the difficulty in seeing the ring is kind of fun. In fact, even notice he's not holding the ring out. He's holding the ring in, right? So that it's he's looking at the ring, right? This is a this what is being captured in this statue is a moment between Celebrimbor and his ring, right? Um, he's not examining his work, not showing it off, not displaying it exactly. Which, of course, makes sense as, like, displaying the ring to the outside world is kind of what the uh, what the rings of power were not about. Elvish rings, anyway. Okay. Um, okay, there. Just cross the threshold now. Ruins are ours. You're going to send more people to attack, and then my cat's going to destroy them. Okay. Do you have more? You do. get them. Okay, there we go. Right, You're, we're gonna... There you go. Okay. Another Celebrimbor statue. Another brace of Celebrimbor statues. Who's he yelling at? He's saying to get us, but there isn't anybody else here or left. Oh, here he comes. <clears throat> All right. Hey, got a medallion. Um, okay. What is this construction? Is this just... Oh, now here, these are the books that Elrond took. Okay. Okay. This was like the restricted sex section, so he took them. Yeah, this is the restricted section, clearly. The rest of this was all just fluff. Um... This platform, this does kind of look like an oration platform, but I really don't think it is. It's just got bookcases above and below. So I think that this ledge up here is just for reaching these inner bookcases. And these are completely stripped. Elrond has made off with every single book in this section and left like every single other uh, book. Where have we seen that pattern? That, like, mushroom slash ionic column uh, pattern that we can see on the sides of these steps here? I know I've seen it before, but I can't place it.
Huh. Don't know why. So I accidentally made my way straight to the boss, which is, of course, not my original intention. Let's see if Elrond took any more books. Let's see if we can find, let's see if we find any more empty bookcases. Oh, there are three bosses, Deathman? Well, there we go. Okay, well, no wonder I found one so quickly. Apparently, the place yeah, is lousy. Yeah, I guess to go bosses. down and then up on the other. Oh, I see right there. It's telling me to defeat another chieftain. Okay. All right, so we'll go down. Oh, yeah, I guess we could go down that way. Whee! Okay. Um, so we'll limp our way over this way. Okay, right. We clearly haven't been here. Okay. More boring books. Apparently these are all duplicates or things that Elrond was able to get through interlibrary loan. Okay. And then up here. Oh, this is just back out. Okay. Is this to a different place we couldn't get to because of that fallen column? Yeah, there's two different sides of up here. Ah, uh, right, yeah, it's separated on both sides, right. Got it. Oh, yeah, here we go. Lots of company here. Which is the one where I beat them with my staff? Oh, yeah, it's this one, right? Okay. Right. Oh, hey, so I forgot, but I won't forget again, to talk about the banners, which I presume are original Elvish banners, because, well, yeah, we do have the same thing here with the second boss. So the bosses are protecting the inner sanctums. Like the restricted sections of the library, as you said, Katriana. Um, oh no, it's not your time to die. Except when it is. Okay. Um, you maggots were supposed to report it an hour ago. Okay. Okay, so banners. These banners have to be original because, of course, we've seen these same banners in Rivendell. And it would be funny if this is where Elrond originally got them. Though, of course, he's left these, but presumably uh, um, presumably he had others. And these are the Earth and Fire banners. And notice the prominence of the white tree with the stars, right? the nine stars in the white tree with a mountain behind it. And the image in the background, right, seems to suggest, as we were finally picking up in Elrond, um, in Elrond's house, right, in Rivendell, um, the elements, the elemental pattern, right? So we've got the two earth and the one fire banner with the dragon and the trees. Um, And yeah, it Druid's Fire, I agree. It's very interesting that the dragon is is sort of central there, right? Is made dominant there. Um, we have the three banners, you know, and the three bosses, both of them, you know, so these three different areas parallel with the three rings, and yet we don't have the elements corresponding to the three rings. So you don't get air or fire or any or air or water here any yeah yeah we're missing air and water we only get fire and then double earth which of course we don't get a ring of earth anyway so like the one element which is not represented um in the rings of the elvish rings of power oh this is the dude huh okay Ooh. 
Gursh, okay. Is he a little fiery? My blades bite deeply as they move like the wind. I I'm a little that. dirt in the eyes. I'm just, you're I'm very red skin, which is very interesting. I was just about to look at your belt, but then you collapse onto your stomach, so never mind. Okay, oh, birds being attacked. Okay, there we go. All right. So he was just hanging out down here, so there's no, uh... Wow. Okay. Crows. Um... I think he spawned after we killed the other two. Okay. Yeah, it's funny how, um... Uh, Narnia is getting all of this, uh, these runes and things, and he's never had a legendary weapon. Um, but anyway, um, I was just looking at this column, the one that's blocking, because it's different from the others. Where did it come from? No idea. Yeah, I don't really see where it collapsed from, unless it got... I have no idea where it came from. It didn't just fall there, clearly. Um, interesting. Well, the I like the central the central garden here, but the the kind of I don't know the biggest take home from the architecture of the library here is the 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 really interesting eclectic nature i gotta go back and and consider i i don't see any clear reason to second guess the conclusion that we made back in duelon that those were human statues um even of course like even the style of that sword that that dude was holding was a human style most i mean the, uh, we don't see elves with swords like that in fact it looks more almost like a rohiric sword than it looks like an elvish sword um so yeah i don't know why we would get these numenorian touches in the middle you know here here in tom mirodine um um it's it's a little curious to me. The only th link that I can see is like commemorating the last alliance. Um, but you know, the last alliance is afterwards. I mean, unless we're, we're thinking about this as, you know, a couple different la layers of architecture. Um, cause of course this was a second age building. I so thought most of the life of this place would predate Lendl and all them coming exactly. over. It really would. So those would have had to be put up afterwards. Um, like in the Third Age. But I thought the elves were gone from here by then. They were. The Noldor, anyway. Yeah. Um, so... At least, I mean, like the people of Holland, like the elves of Celebrimbor... Uh, weren't here anymore. I mean, they're not there. They get cleared out by Sauron in the second age. Um, yeah, with Celebrimbor and his gru gruesome display. So it's a little puzzling. I have a hard time figuring this out, and I don't know exactly why maybe I'm wrong about those other statues maybe those other statues aren't human statues but if they're elvish statues I don't know why they look like they do and I don't know I don't know who they could be um, if you know the dude with the scepter and the dude with the sword are not a Lendil and Isildur respectively I don't know, and it makes sense in Duolond as we were discussing it when we were there, thinking about an elvish commemoration of the landing of Elendil here in the north. 
um, or there in the north, rather. Um, but here, yeah, it would have to be some kind of revisionist architecture. There would have to have been... Okay, let's look at something for a second. Let's... Let's look at the area door map. Let's look at the Aregean map. Okay, so we're down here around Mirabel, right? Tom Myrdine. Okay, and let's think about the road, right? So, the Gondorian Road, the South Road, comes up through Dunlin and Edwith and swings way to the east, so it comes nowhere near Regian. Yeah. So even though we're on the extreme, uh, sorry, to the west, I mean, um, it swing, swings to the west of Regian. Even though we're on the extreme western side of Aregia. Oh, darn it. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think, like, could there have been, like, a, a, a Gondorian or Arnorian presence here after? Um, you know, in, in the Third Age after the War of the Last Alliance. Because if there were, it would be conceivable that, um, you know, Gondorians coming through here would, you know, do some adding on. But I don't know. Like I said, it seems pretty far out of their way. Well, there are rivers running through here that yeah, I think that where Tom Mirdine is is by the beginning of the Glanduin River, right? Which is going to connect down to the Guathlo going out to the sea. Um, so this here, at the crossing of the Guathlo, that's where Tharbad was. And Tharbad was a pretty major... was a, was a, was a fairly significant city. So up the Glanduin from Tharbad... Back in the old days, you know, would that have been... So, yeah, so this river down here between Mirabel and Tom Mirdine would presumably be, you know, the, the beginnings of the, of the, of the Glanduin there, um, with the river Siranon running down from the walls of Moria, usually, to it. Um... So it's possible that there could be Gondorian influence. It's just that nowhere else in Eregion do we see that, that I recall. I mean, all of it, um, you know, Echad Eregion and um, Gwingris and, and, and the others, and uh, Echad Dunan, are all very, very elvish. elvish. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, not sure, not sure what to make of it. Um, but I'm going to be keeping an eye out for columns like this now. Definitely. All right. Interesting anyway. to see if they're in that other place in Trollshaw. Yes, 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 it would be in Delisad. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at that. Um, yeah, to do a comparison of the insides. Unfortunately, Narnian can't get in there because you've got to be in, like, you know, book 11 of the... <laughs> or 10 of the of the epic quest line to get in there. Um, but, uh, all right. Well, I should probably let, it, let everybody go. It's getting late now. It's, uh, it's almost 1230. Um... But uh, thanks for joining me tonight, Katriana. This is this is uh, uh, Eregion is a fun place to come to. I love 
the story of Celebrimbor and certainly the, the, you know, the location of the forging of the Rings of Power uh, and the center of Celebrimbor's little world here uh, is uh, a fascinating place to think about and a very, a very mythic site uh, for Lotro to, to kind of engage with. Uh, so uh, uh, these, are all, these, uh, these instances are always kind of fun. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. Thank you. Well, that was great. And so we'll be back next week. We'll we'll go back uh, after a couple weeks away uh, to Arid Lewin and continue our examination over there um, uh, uh, in our field trip next week. Um, and then don't forget, Baymoot coming up. So if you're in uh, uh, California, out in the Bay Area, come join us in Berkeley next, a week from Saturday. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Good night, and I will see you guys next week. Bye now. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.